Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third InfoSec Edge CMMC webcast. My name is Jeff Peters, and I'll be moderating today's session, which is all about the CMMC assessment process. I'm going to introduce our panel here in just a moment, but first we'd like to share a couple tips to make this a more interactive and engaging experience for all the live attendees today. All of you are on listen only mode, which means that you're muted, but you are more than welcome to ask questions at any time by typing them into the control panels question feature. We also had a number of CMMC questions submitted to our webinars at infosecinstitute.com email. So we plan to spend uh, the back half of the webinar today answering all your CMMC questions. So feel free to uh, drop them in. So joining us today, we have Leighton Johnson. He is the CTO of Information Security Forensics Management Team, a provider of cybersecurity and forensics consulting and certification training. He has presented security and forensics lectures, uh, conference presentations, training events, seminars, all across the US, Asia, and Europe. And he has over 40 years experience with his primary focus areas, including computer security, information operations and assurance, incident response and forensics investigations, testing systems using the software system development lifecycle, systems engineering and integration activities, database admin and cyber defense. He's also a certified CMMC provisional assessor. Our other guest today is Mrs. Stacy Hyde Brinkley and she is the vice president of compliance solutions and services at CASC and has more than 25 years experience as an information security professional her background includes building and securing networks with expertise in establishing and implementing streamlined cybersecurity programs. She holds numerous cyber certifications and is a certified CMMC provisional assessor, as well as a DOD RMF assessor. Her expertise of the cyber domain includes technical aspects such as ensuring proper implementation of security controls and hardening networks, as well as non-technical and policy implementation. Uh, excited to have you guys both back today for the uh, third webinar. Hey, good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you. I like it. Uh, and just a quick reminder before we uh, jump into the meat of the presentation, uh, this is the last of our three CMMC sessions. Um, so today we're going to keep the discussion as much as we can focused around the actual CMMC assessment process. I know there's a, a ton of questions that you all have around that. Uh, if you have questions around CMMC career paths or the CMMC ecosystem, we covered those pretty in depth in our previous two webcasts and uh, you're more than welcome to watch those. They're available on demand. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So yeah, we showed this on our, our previous webinars, uh, in kind of an overview of organizations seeking certification details. Uh, today, we're really gonna be focused on step five, which is scheduling that assessment and getting assessed and all the, the stuff that goes into there. Uh, but before we get into that, um, obviously there's a few things that go into leading up to getting that assessment. Um, so is there anything you wanted to cover? We can start with you, Leighton, just about you know, preparing for that assessment? Well, one of the things you always need to do is you need to read the entire CMMC model so you know what kinds of uh, support documentation you need to have already developed as part of the process. Um, and that goes through steps one and two. Then you pre-register and pre-assess by looking at what it is with what you have, doing step three, close any gaps you have uh, where there are areas not covered in the 17 areas that CMMC looks at, and then you can go ahead and get ready to hit step five. Yeah, uh, Stacy, I believe you're going, or currently going through the assessment. Um, so what was that process like for you in terms of prepping for, you know, the actual assessment that was gonna happen or that is happening? So uh, just like Leighton said, we actually follow the exact steps, right? We had to go through every single step. And I will say the most important step is um, doing your self-assessment, getting a pre-assessment done if you're not comfortable with the first NIST 110 controls, um, but to get your pre-assessment done to make sure you have all of those security implementations done properly and that you have that documentation in place that shows you surely are uh, showing a maturity process. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, we, we talked a lot on the previous webinars about how this isn't really... Uh, you know, it, it's a new assessment, but really a lot of the practices and, and processes in there were pre-established and people were supposed to be, you know, self-certified. Um, and it sounds like the difference really is now it's more continuous instead of, you know, just getting, or like, like you had mentioned previously when we were talking late and, you know, it used to be like every three years, but now it's more of a continuous process. And that's one of the bigger changes. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Right. Well, one of the biggest things is this is all about doing this on an ongoing basis because, of course, the cybersecurity field itself and what's out there, what the threats are, are always changing. So we need to keep it up to date as to what's going on versus, you know, what was happening six months ago um, and those types of things. There weren't that many attacks before on critical infrastructure. Now we've had nothing but attacks on critical infrastructure in the last six months. So as an example, those are the kinds of things that keep shifting and changing. Yeah, and on this next slide here, um, a lot of this presentation is actually pulled from the CMMC level one and level three assessment guides. So uh, the, these slides are available and with all the links and um, Camille will be dropping that in the chat so you guys can, can check them out. And we'll also send it in the follow-up email. Um, but yeah, is there anything that you wanted to highlight here in terms of some of these official resources that organizations can use and that assessors will, will use? We can start with, with you, Stacy. So yeah, so you definitely want to go to these links and download the level one and level three. Uh, of course, level three covers level one, right? They're iterative. Um, but it is, uh, if you go to the CMMC AD site, there is a link to the OUSD, um, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition website. That's the authoritative place to go. Um, and that's where you'll see any updates um, in the near future or anything like that to the documentation. Um, but if you go through these documents and, and really go through these and ensure you're um, you know, lining up with those, you're going to be in good shape. You're going to be in good shape. Anything you wanted to add there, Leighton? Just that this is, since this is the official location, these are the official guides these are the ones that we got to keep in mind that we always are going to use as references um, when anybody gets an assessment and anybody's setting up for an assessment this is where you go to find the actual documentation that's necessary for you to meet everything to go through that first step of getting all the documents together policies plans practice procedures whatever it might be yeah, and, and within the uh, CMMC level one and level three assessment, uh, they kind of outline the, some of the key points of the assessment process. So uh, before we dig in, yeah, to the, to the meat of what happens, uh, I think the, the big thing here is, um, you know, when we talk about the pre-assessment is really the, the third section there where the assessment scope is, you know, really predetermined by the organization that's seeking certification and the C3PO that they're going to be contracting with. Um, and then the second second section there talks about how, you know, no matter what the organization is going to follow that that same process. Um, yeah, anything that you wanted to, to point out here, Leighton? Well, I think the big thing about scope is understanding that OSCs figure they have one scope. And often when there are assessors that come together from the C3PO with going through what they view as scope, there are other areas that may be covered, so the scope may change. And that's why scoping is always the first step in any of these assessment efforts, no matter what you do, because there are areas for both federal contract information, FCI, as well as for controlled unclassified information, CUI, that may not have been necessarily considered by the organization itself, where there are other locations, potentially other systems, potentially that have that type of information that need to be considered and evaluated as part of the assessment. So scoping is always the first big step once you actually get into having to do an assessment and working through the process. And that means that you need to really consider where it all is and when you're building your own documentation and what you consider to be in scope, you have to ensure that the documents cover everything. All the 17 practices mm -hmm. for level three. Um, yeah, so let's just touch briefly on the levels before we get into uh, all the, the, the methodology of the assessments and what the assessors are going to be doing. Uh, we shared this as well in our previous slide, uh, previous two webinars. Uh, just kind of outlining, you know, what the CMMC domains and different levels are. And then we have some slides here showing specifically, you know, CMC level one uh, and then CMC level three, which we'll show in a sec in, in, in just a moment. Um, but it's my understanding that most organizations that are going to be going through this process are going to be assessed at CMMC level one. Um, is that is that accurate? 
Um, it it's changing every day. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know that DOD originally put in that they expected somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 percent all organizations would be level one. Uh, but I also know that what I began to see as part of this is rolling out is that number is dropping and the number around level three is growing, um, depending upon especially the fact that level one covers FCI and level three covers CUI. And that's where the big difference is, where there's more organizations who have CUI than were expected to have, I think um or at least projected to have i'll say um as far as that goes so the level numbers are you know um there level one everybody has to do who's going to have a defense dod contract that has fci that has contract information that's not public okay as it says right in the middle of the screen all right that type of thing where it says information not intended for public release that's provided by the government or generated for the government under contract. All right, hey, that type of thing. And it does not include public information. It does not include um, accounting information per se, as they say in their documentation, but it does include all the other types of contract type information that everybody's going to have as part of those efforts. Now, the ones that move to the next level whereas CUI is what's varying right now. Um, we see a lot of changes in how many organizations feel they have CUI and therefore need to be at a level three. Um, and they're you know working through how that's covered, where that is, those types of things as well. Anything you want to add, Stacey? Yeah, no, in the beginning, we thought we were going to see a lot of the uh, maturity level three folks uh, walk through the door and, and ask us questions. And we're finding more and more maturity level three um, folks are coming in, uh, requesting um, help, getting them ready for pre-assessments or mm -hmm. gaps and getting them ready for their threes. Um, we have had quite a few folks um, ask, hey, can we get to level one first, you know, hang out there and see if we need to get to three. And I'm like, sure, you can do that, but you will, that's where when Leighton was talking about scoping, it's really important knowing if and when you're going to hold FCI or CUI data. That's the key. And uh, if you're looking ahead, what contracts might have that in there that you know about? So it's, it's a lot of planning ahead of time. It's a lot of budget drills, whether you're going to go to level one or level three, whether which one is required per contracts you're going to go after or that you currently have. Yeah, we have a, a question coming in asking, why'd we skip level two? Uh, so could, could you elaborate on level two and four and kind of how they fit into the framework here? Well, level two is a transition step from FCI to CUI. It's the first step where we add, we go from 17 to 72 practices of coverage. It's about half CUI coverage there. And then the other half is when we actually go to level three and you get 58 of the rest to make the whole 130 total. Um, it's a transition area. Um, it covers 15 of the 17 domains um, in that effort. The two domains it doesn't have is asset management and situational awareness, but it has all the other ones. Um, and those are transitioning to make sure the organization is actually prepared to handle CUI, that they understand what it means around risks and around uh, assessment and media protection and configuration and those types of things uh, as it starts to step its way through those efforts. Level four and level five, the last two are advanced and those are more for those unique DOD contractors who are exposed to um, significant um, advanced persistent threats and have a proactive approach to being able to handle those. And so, um, and they're based upon the uh, additional criteria. As you'll see in here, we talk a lot about 800-171's guidance. Well, level four and level five are based on 8172 guidance, which is an extension for those two area, those two levels 
uh, in those mechanisms. And since that's recently just been finally approved, it hasn't been fully incorporated into the full model yet. And so it's still in draft form for level four and five, and we'll see how long it takes and what organizations. I know there are initial numbers were like 1% of all contracts or half a percent of all contracts would be at those levels. At least that was their initial projection. Uh, we'll see in the end what it actually ends up being, but that's the advanced area. So we would expect a very small subset of all defense contractors to have to deal with level four and level five. Yeah, and Stacy, as a C3PO, like, are are you expecting to see many people or organizations getting assessed at level two, or is it primarily, you know, skipping that so, stepping stone and going to three? So right now, no, we're we're seeing either one or threes. That's it. Um, and remember, level two is very important because that's where your maturity level really really steps up. You got your policies and your procedures. Very very important. It's it's one of the most important steps, I have to say. Um, and so, no, we're seeing most folks right now going for maturity level three. But then again, I'm right here in Virginia in the Washington, D.C. area. That's what all the DOD government contractors in this area, you know, are going for. So I'm kind of right here in the hotbed. Um, there are certainly uh, a lot of folks that are going to be going through level one. Um, and that's important, too, right, because that's your basic cyber hygiene. Yeah, and uh, with that, I think we should spend, you know, the most of the rest of the webinar here really digging into the CS, CMMC assessment methodology and the criteria, what the assessment is going to be like, uh, what the assessors are doing. I know we have a, a, probably a lot of questions around like the specifics there. Um, so this is again pulled from from the, those guys that we shared earlier on uh, I think the, the, the third slide. And really it starts by talking about these objects. So um, yeah, Leighton, can you kind of explain right. what these four different objects are? All right. The assessment is going to be looking at four different areas uh, that specify how the practice is being utilized, implemented, followed in the organization. The first of the four areas is what we call specifications. These are your document-based components. These are your plans, your policies, your procedures, your SSP, if you have one, your architectural design, your network maps, those types of things. Those are what they call specifications in the assessment world. The second one is what we call the mechanisms. This is the hardware, the software, the firmware that's implemented to for those practices to actually be secure and come through as far as those efforts go. The third is the mechanisms that involve the people. What are the procedures and how do they do it? And so we look at the activities around those efforts, like doing backups, uh, checking traffic flows, uh, logging in, those types of things as activities that everybody has to follow through on, and that's the activities. The fourth object is the people themselves that are involved, keeping in mind, of course, that everything in, that we look at under cybersecurity looks at the people, the processes, and the technologies. And so the people part is we go talk to them. We walk through what they do. We uh, identify which procedures do they use and that type of thing as part of those processes to confirm, one, that the documents are there and being followed, and two, to confirm that the activities are actually reflecting the practice. Yeah, and, and Stacy, you're currently, as you mentioned, you know, getting assessed and going through that level three assessment. Um, any any kind of color or insights you can provide on on these, or which is most important, or any any interesting tidbits along those lines? Yeah. So the most important thing is everything, <laughs> right? Um, you have to make sure it all comes together, and it all comes together in a story from the beginning, the middle, the end. This is how you secure your environment. This is how you are protecting CUI at all levels, whether it is physical, logical, what your folks are doing, how they are trained, making sure they're aware. You're, the whole goal is protecting CUI and the div, right? And so that's why all four of these things come together in your assessment 
um, when you're doing first your documentation review and then maybe you're doing your physical controls and then you're going through each and every domain step by step ensuring that the procedures follow what the policies say and that your SSP or your plans are in place that you can actually show that it's a repeatable mature process that's the most important yeah, great. So so these slides here, or this slide here, talks about the things that assessors are going to look at. And then on the next slide here, we have the action. So this is basically how they're going to invest, investigate those four things. Um, so yeah, Stacey, can you you know provide us a little insight into to each of these three and, and, and what people can expect there? Sure. So um, the three pieces um, of objective evidence are interview, examine, and test. And, and you can see what those say right there, right? So for a CMMC, you need to have at least two pieces of objective evidence for a practice to be met. So you have three choices, met, not met, or possibly not applicable. So when you're during these hybrid days, right, when you're off site, possibly doing an assessment, you're going to have two of those for sure. But I'm also finding out you may need three, right, because if you're examining documentation, you probably also need to interview someone and, and have a test because if you're off site, how do you know whether they're just reading the documentation? So you might end up having three pieces of objective evidence. But in the guide, it states that you need two pieces of objective evidence. Um, and like I just said, sometimes it's going to be up to the assessor to make sure they can in, indeed know whether that practice is met or not met. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and let's get into each of these three uh, a little bit more detail, and then I see we have a whole bunch of questions coming in, so we can then touch on some of the questions. Um, so let's start with the first one, the interview. I mean, obviously, I have a lot of questions myself there, you know, like how many people are being interviewed? How long are these interviews? What are the types of questions being asked? Um, Leighton, could you, you know, start with you and maybe provide a little insight into typically, that process? Typically, the way I conduct an interview is I do it based on the examination primarily what's documentation say they're supposed to be doing? What's the documentation say the areas are? And so I will focus the interviews on two areas. Give me a walkthrough of what you do, how you do it in a day-to-day -day effort. And then any areas that they don't touch in the walkthrough, I move to what practice activities do you do in such and such an area, such as access or, um, have you been trained on incident response? If so, what areas is your focus on the incident response effort or those types of things. But it's based upon starting with what the documentation says that they're following within that organization. So we interview key personnel in each of the areas. We obviously have to interview the management in those areas for the oversight and maturity views of the organization to ensure that it's appropriately funded and managed and strategically uh, following in its oversight uh, in its maturity within the organization that they've been doing it uh, for a while to ensure those efforts. And that is a determination that is usually determined by the ob objects that we come up with. And then the, as Stacy said, the objective evidence that produces the results. But we start by interviewing the um, different levels, management, workers, key personnel, system owners, security personnel, whatever it might be within the organization in these areas. Yeah, and then Stacey, I'm, I'm wondering, is the interview typically up front or do you do some interviews and then maybe you uncover stuff and then you have to do more interviews? Do you have any insight into how, like, process wise how that works? So for an assessment, you're walking in the door and you're assessing. So you're going to say whether it's met or not met. A pre-assessment, you're going to consult and help them get to that point, right? But in an assessment, you're going to first off, and let me back up one second. So in order to obtain the information for the assessment, what happens is that the C3PAO will send the OSC a document called an intake form, and they will also send a document called the assessment plan. And we work back and forth with the OSC in getting that information, which includes the scoping, what's, what's in their boundary for the CUI for level three, 
who are the stakeholders? Who are we going to interview? The HR, the FSO, your IT, your legal, your CM. So you have those folks written down with their emails and phone numbers. And so when you're going through the assessment and the domains, especially in your procedures, you're putting who does what in there. You might have it in the front, a list of folks, so that the assessor knows who they're going to interview on what domains and what their information is. So you don't go scurrying around the last minute going, oh my gosh, where's Scooby-Doo? You know, you know exactly where he is and mm -hmm. you have his number and you can call him. So it gets scheduled ahead of time, right? So you schedule all of these interviews ahead of time to make sure everyone is there. But it is in the assessment plan. You do have that information there ahead of time, both the OSC and the C3PAO. So you work together in conjunction to make sure you're prepared um, to go ahead and do the assessment. Uh, great, yeah, let's move on then to the, the second action here, which is examine. Um, yeah, Stacy, can you talk a little bit about what's all entailed there? So the important part here is, um, and, and how it's going right now, is that um, you're, they're gonna review your documentation first to see if you are ready for the assessment, because if you're, you've got to look at the SSP, your procedures, your your policies, your plans, your FSO, your uh, you know every if you think about it, your training, right, your security awareness training, all these documents that show you've been doing this, that you have a mature um, level um, for your security programs. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to have all those documents examined, and once the assessor feels they look good their team is gonna come back and go, okay, we've looked at all your documentation and this is the examined part in the first part of the assessment. And then it all looks good. We, we don't have any questions, we're good to go. And then they will start the formal assessment. Now you're gonna probably get some examination, of course, during the formal assessment, but the big bulk of examination is gonna happen when they're reviewing all the documentation. The important part here is foot stop, make sure it all lines up, right? The policies, procedures, they all line up together. You say it here in your policy, and this is exactly how you do it in your procedure. That's real important. Anything you wanted to add there, Leighton? Um, examine is um, one of the biggest areas to initially focus for organizations themselves in preparation. You got to have a policy, a procedure, and a plan for each of the 17 domains at level three. And so you got to have at least that level of documentation for all 17 areas, okay, as part of those mechanisms. Now, you may have an SSP because of 171 criteria. You may have a whole series of documentation that's there based on current government contract efforts under CUI, which we talked about in the last discussion, the last webinar. Uh, those all count, too. All of those matter. All of those show maturity. Remember, the whole process we're talking about here is about managing the information. It's not about technologies. It's about practices and the information. We're looking for how is the organization handling the CUI and the FCI, the information. Okay? I don't care what technology you use to implement antivirus, just that you have one okay? and that it's active okay? and that it's automatic those types of things. Uh, it doesn't matter which one of the 15 or 20 versions of antivirus you have, just that you have one. Okay? Whereas the old way of assessment, we would look at each one and determine if it was functioning correctly. And here, no, we're worried about the information management. Okay, We're worried about CUI. We're worried about FCI. How is it handled? Where is it? What goes with it? Who transpires? Who interchanges with it? And so examine gives us the starting point with CUI flow diagrams and the plans that they've implemented and the policies as they show, uh, shows where that comes into play. That's why it's a starting point and that's why it's get everything in order first before you actually ask them in. Because if the examiner themselves or the assessor has to go and do extra examinations once on site, that means that it wasn't all in the initial documentation, and that may or may not influence the assessment. We don't know. That's up to the assessor for that matter. 
Yeah, then the third action here is, is test. Uh, Stacey, you want to talk a little bit about how that works? Yep. So um, actually, so what you're going to do is after you get past your documentation review, what you'll do is for your assessment, we'll go through and we'll actually test different areas or actually walk through them like Leighton mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you say you have uh, mobile device management. So we're going to say, hey, let's bring up that uh, mobile device server and show us and, and show us how we're running through. Show us your phone. Show us, you know, that you're you're using this mobile device management. And we'll run through the tests of, of what their procedures say, how they do this. So that's why the procedures are so important, not only to the assessor but to the OSC. They have the steps and the process exactly in place of how they do this. So we're going to say, okay, uh, you know, show us how you do it, and and that's how how it, the test is going to roll. Um, that's why it is important to actually have those steps updated to date, right? Um, like Leighton had referred, you can have a lot of antivirus programs and all of a sudden you get to the test site and you might go, oh my gosh, we upgraded, I forgot to update the steps for the new antivirus. So you wanna go through and make sure all of these things are up to date and that you have them properly step-by-step, step. you know, try it yourself, walk through it yourself with your folks, with your IT folks, with your, HR folks, you know, for the onboarding, offboarding, go ahead and test those those procedures beforehand. And Anything as a follow on to what Stacy says, for example, in testing and her her example using mobile device management, we call it up, we have them call it up, we then immediately go to three or four practices and look at it. For example, in mobile device management, they got to know how many devices they have what is their serial number in order to manage it. That's yeah. part of the asset management practice. Then they have to identify each of the device and who it's tied to. That's part of the IA practice. Yeah. Then they have to, how do they authenticate it so that it's within the system and they can monitor and, and manage it. That's access control practice. You see, they get linked together yeah. in the testing as Long part of those quantity. efforts. Yeah. yeah, and then, or you know, how is it recorded? How are the logs handled? Those types of things in auditing and in monitoring and those types of things. So the the testing isn't always done, as it says down here at the bottom. Not all practices require testing, but it is an additional piece of objective evidence that shows in a demonstrative process how that practice is implemented and shows its level of maturity as well. Because remember, the two M's in the middle of CMMC stand for maturity model. How well are they doing it and how structured is the process and how long, as well as what are the results that shows the maturity level? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a, a number of questions that have come in. So we'll, we'll take some of them right now before we uh, move, move along. Um, so, um, Ryan is asking, do we have any references to the CMMC level statistics that you mentioned? I believe Leighton, you referenced like at one point, you know, 60% of agencies were expected to be this level. Um, the references are basically what's been done in public forums by the management of the model at OSD. Uh, Katie Arrington, Stacey Boschwitz, and the rest of them um, are the ones who use those references. The only things I can say that are actually documented besides the presentations is the day, paperwork that they filed when they filed the DFAR change for CMMC. And that's about it. Great. Um, and then we have a question here from Michael. Uh, is there a specific process for scope determination? Are assessors developing a security assessment plan? So, yeah. So, I talked about the assessment plan a little bit ago how we go back and we make sure that the OSC has defined their scope properly um, to make sure that they have identified the boundary where their FCI or CUI is, right? Where is that boundary? Are you gonna ML3 your whole company or are you gonna VLAN that off in one little area? Or, hey, maybe you might be a subcontractor to a bigger company and you will use their equipment when you're at their facility in their ML3 facility. So you're, you yourself, will we'll actually work for them using their assets um, as an ML3. So it depends on your scoping 
Um, and, and the scoping, when you're asking if there's scope, there is some scoping documentation out there that, ha um, that has helped some folks. I know they're working on it. Leighton probably knows more about it. Um, I know they are working on a scoping document, but there are references out there that can help you figure it out. All right, then we have another question here from uh, Michael. Are, are, are the assessors demanding a certain type of objective evidence? Are they shoulder surfing? Are they taking technicians? Um, or, or are they asking technicians to conduct a documented procedure, et cetera? Yeah. It literally depends. <laughs> All of those are, are possible, yeah. okay? Yeah, I understand that it literally depends on um, what they're trying to determine around the practice. All right, that type of thing. So any of those are possible. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you mentioned shoulder surfing. So let's say you're doing a physical access control. You know, you're walking around their facility, making sure their badging requirements are set in stone. I walk through the door and I hold the door for the assessor who does not have a badge. So I'm escorting the assessor. But then one of my folks walks behind me. Well, they need to swipe their badge. So sometimes there's there's some things that you don't realize are security, but you're you're monitoring who's coming in and out of your facility at all times. Um, so there there are some shoulder surfing that that the assessors will do. So they will do um, examine, interview, or test to ensure the practice is met. That's the goal. Yeah, and kind of related to that, we have a, another question from Chris. He says, is there a requirement that will indicate what practices could or should require testing? Um, I imagine it's probably, it depends again, but is there any areas that are tested more than others, There's you think? nothing in concrete around testing. What's in concrete is that two out of three need to have objective evidence. Um, so typically the third is test, and that's why it's not all practices have required testing okay um, typically we work with the first two to start with and then we determine upon assessment if we need additional objective evidence and that's where the testing would come in so no it's not a given okay um, right. that type of thing uh, as part of those processes and we have another question related to practices. How long do they have to be in place before being CMMC audited? Is there any timeline requirement? That's up to the assessor as well. Uh, to, to determine the maturity level is a, a, an evaluation. And that's why their assessors are trained specially to look for those types of things um, as part of our training, as well as our practice and past efforts of doing these types of assessments and reviews. Um, there's no, uh, because it's a maturity veil, there's no 100% objective point that you can say it's mature or not mature, all right? It's a practice, and so it's how well are you doing it? Are you doing good cyber hygiene? Do you have the pieces in place to do good cyber hygiene? If, are you doing basic cyber hygiene? Hence the difference between level one and level three. All right. Or are you doing proactive cyber hygiene, which is level five? All right. It, it's and it's an evaluation. It, it's you know it is a subjective view. I agree. And so there's no concrete. It's either you know you're at this, you're there. It is. Does it show those areas? Does it show advancement, uh, et cetera, from the beginning at basic, moving its way up to good uh cyber hygiene at level three etc yeah i'm gonna take a few more questions here before we go back to the slides um i have another question about how interviews are conducted he, he asked um how do you qualitative or quantitatively measure the method for interviews and how is how are those interviews expressed or reported so, yeah so what we do is we go through the interviews uh, once we have the stakeholders from the assessment plan, then once those are scheduled, so we go through the interviews, let's say um, with the, your IT um, system administrator and, and maybe going through how administrators or how users are added, um, how they are approved, um, how you showing them how you use multi-factor authentication, things like that. Um, and that's how you can actually go through um, and, and you're testing your procedures out. Um, it, it could be with your HR folks, your 
your facility security officer, any of those folks. All right, a couple more questions here. Uh, Daryl asked, have you seen people or organizations leverage 800-53 to achieve level three certification? So Absolutely, this... everything in the world is is based on 853 because 800-171 is an extension of 853 on the government side. Now, the one thing to remember here is we're not using 853 or 800-171 um, as part of those, especially 853 because that was designed to run government systems. It's not designed to run contractor systems. And so it's much more extensive, much more areas of coverage. You know, the number of areas of coverage in 853 are like four or five times as much as what's covered in CMMC. Okay, so that's the other thing you have to pay attention to. For example, when we're here, we're talking about doing a standard 130 practices in the cloud, in a cloud environment. If we move to the FedRAMP criteria for government uh, for uh, systems, we move to an equivalent level of 400 controls, 400 areas of, of areas you have to look at rather than 130. All right, so is it based on 853? Ultimately, yes. However, there are extensions and other things that have been added to it by DOD from a variety of sources primarily the first area, which is the FAR requirements under the Federal Acquisition Regulations, which is 15 of the first 17 for level one, right? They're not found anywhere else. They're found in the regulation, that type of thing. So um, is it based there? Yeah. Is it ultimately only there? No. And the other thing is 853 is focused on technologies. It's not necessarily focused on practices. And that's the other big shift here, is this is focused on practices. Uh, yeah, and then another question, is the certification for North America only, or is it valid for other regions the DOD contracts with? Everywhere in the world. Anybody who's a defense contractor is gonna have to meet this criteria. Ultimately, by the end of the DFAR component 7021, which says 1 October 2025, every defense contractor. USA, no okay. matter where they're at. Yep. Awesome. Uh, yeah, there's a, a number of other questions, but let's go back, uh, go through a couple of these slides here, uh, and then we'll get back to some of these live questions. Um, so yeah, we talked about these, the four assessment objects and then the three assessment actions, and that ultimately leads to the assessment findings, which are either met, not met, or not applicable. So um, yeah, Stacy, is there anything um, to highlight here into how this process works with actual Finding the assessments? Yeah, you're you're probably not going to have a lot of not applicable. <laughs> so you don't want to go in there thinking, oh, most of my stuff is not applicable. Most of it is. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I think we had one uh, that in our we don't develop software. That's our only not applicable practice out of 130. That's it. Um, so you're you're probably going to have to have them met in order to get ML3. Um, and this is um, also in the intake form, the assessment plan. This is where we'll ask, hey, um, who, what are you using, cloud or on-prem? You know, do you have shared responsibilities? Because no matter if you're in the cloud or not, you're going to have shared responsibilities for these controls. Your cloud provider is not going to take 100% of this. Um, they, they do take a lot, certain cloud providers, but you still have that shared responsibility to show that you are... Um, doing your own security, taking care of your own um, maturity level three so that you can get certified. Um, yeah, and then one other thing to call out are these inherited practices. And then we have a couple of questions related to this as well. So, uh, yeah, Leighton, uh, can you explain how these work? The practices that somebody else does for you are ones that you get from them. Those are called inherited practices. All right, whatever they might be. If they're managing your data in whatever form, if it's a managed service provider, a data center, a cloud provider, doesn't matter, they're just known as an external service provider, they're providing the actual activity for you, typically under contract at some level, um, where they are taking care of those activities 
and efforts for your organization and you're paying them in remuneration back to where they're doing that all right now what you need to do is have those practices evaluated as well now how much and what is covered is what gets discussed in the scoping okay as far as those efforts of what's on location within the organization or they have contracted out to another party and that other party because they are handling your cui has to also be involved in the assessment and everything that that means <laughs> objective evidence, proof of implementation, who gets on their system, how they manage it, all of it. Awesome, and then the last couple slides here are just related to the timeline uh, for the rollout, and we have a couple questions here. So uh, this is a slide from our ebook, which shows you know, some of the InfoSec training that we provide on the top, and then some of the, the additional information on the bottom. Um, but one of the questions we have is, uh, Andrew's asking, do you anticipate that the DOD will move the deadline up from October 1st, 2025? What do you mean up? Do you mean later or earlier? <laughs> earlier, well, Either one, dude, not. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe it'll be earlier because they have to do it in a phased approach because there's so many contractors that have to yeah. be covered. We're talking over 300,000 organizations that have to be covered. And there's... Uh, as it stands as of today right now there's only two official c3paos that are actually authorized to do the final versions stacy's and there's a few others who are going through their final stages but as of today there's only two and so the timing is going to probably stretch out to be later and later i would anticipate but i wouldn't guarantee it it all depends on how DOD projects the requirements in their pilot programs as they've been working their way through it. Right now, there's 10 pilot programs for fiscal 21 um, that have to be reviewed by the end of September, all right, to get ready for their new contract um, and renewals in some cases. Um, there's 75 scheduled for the next fiscal year. There's, uh, you know, this schedule is on the DOD website. If you really want to follow the rollout, follow it there. All right, we had, like I mentioned, we had a number of pre-submitted questions. So I want to make sure we have time to get to them. And then if we have any time after this, we'll get to the remaining uh, questions that have been submitted live. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of questions also on the live side, just about the cost of the certification, um, and then you know, people wondering if any of that can be reimbursed. So can you talk a little bit about about the cost to here? Maybe start with you, Layton. As DoD has projected that the cost of the actual certification is a reimbursable overhead cost on the contract that it's required. On. Everything else is on the contract. So the cost of the certification itself, the negotiated cost between the OSC and the C2PO to get their certification, to go through the review, the assessment, that's reimbursable. But everything else that the organization has to do to build up to that is non-reimbursable. At this point, that's the way it's laid out. Now, lots of discussions all over the place even in congress about how does that work with small business and medium business and uh, overseas businesses and all sorts of things uh, all of that is external to what's already documented and as it's documented right now the cost of the actual cmmc level certification and its performance by the c3po is the reimbursable cost Everything else is on the contract organization. All right, we had another question here. Uh, what is the status on IS, ISO 27001 reciprocity and how will this affect appraisals for certifications? Uh, there is no one. final answer on any 
program reciprocity between CMMC and any other program as of right now. There are lots of negotiations. I know they're talking to the ISO folks about 27,001. I know they're talking to the FedRAMP folks about FedRAMP uh, uh, organizations and those types of things. But as of right now, none of those have been put in any final format nor any final versions of anything there. As of right now, there is no outside reciprocity. I know there's lots of discussions about it between DOD and these other organizations, but there's been no determination yet. Yeah. All right, we had a couple more here. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, we had a couple of questions come in just regarding CUI. Uh, this person is saying that there seems to be some conflicting guidance around what's marked CUI and who marks what, and you know whether what all falls into this. Um, so yeah, I don't, Stacey, if you have any insight into CUI and, and how that's measured and marked yeah. and, and all that. So, so this is a big conversation also. Um, you know, we're all hoping there'd be a, you know, AI and automatic, you know, document uh, labeling of CUI from the program office down to the contractors. The important part you have to remember is that per contract, it will, it will tell you what, whether you're, if the contract is level one, level three, right? And then as far as marking uh, CUI, um, that's up to everyone to mark it and label it property and, and protect it. Um, but that's why the CUI awareness training is so important. That's why it's so important for folks to go to the CUI registry and understand what CUI is. You could be holding it right now and not know. Um, so, so it is uh, very important for both the contractors and the government to understand that, but it is on the program office themselves to actually let the contractors know what level of CUI or FCI or what level level three or level one is going to be in that contract. So you're going to know right off the bat, oh, uh, okay, this is a level three, I'm having CUI, and then you're going to have to start labeling that appropriately. In order to do that, you need to be aware of what it is. So that's why training is so important for these folks to know exactly what CUI is, technical drawings, um, inter you know, good test testing that they've done at different sites might have some information that has CUI. Um, so there's a lot of areas up there. And if you go to the CUI registry, you will see there are a lot of information. And like I said, the program office on your contract, they're supposed to define um, whether what the level is per contracts. Yeah, and then the next question here is actually well a series of questions, and I think we we covered it a little bit, but um, just just wondering a, a little a bit about the I guess the the processes of you know examine and testing, and we we talked about how you need to do two of the three there. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. anything worth adding around um, like how that process goes, and is it is the evidence like what type of evidence is collected, and is it sent to the CMMB AB assessor for review, or anything worth covering there, Layton? Number one, examine documents, procedures, policies, those are all objective evidence from the examined side that the assessor has looked at. Interview, workshops, whatever you do when you're talking to them, interviewer notes, those are objective evidence components where they said, this is what we do, that type of thing. Those are objective evidence. Then of course, screenshots, Ticket forms, ticketing reports coming from the test side, those would be objective evidence on the test side, number one. Number two, all objective evidence stays with the organization. It doesn't go into the repository at a C3PAO. They keep the evidence on site so that there's no transportation of CUI outside the area being involved. All right, so is it to be sent to them? No. Is it reviewed by them? Yes. All right, now maturity determines how long you're going to look for it and what levels are. And that's, as I said earlier, often a call of the assessor uh, to show that you've been doing a particular process for a while, which shows a level of maturity in its implementation. 
Perfect. And then I think this is the last piece of the question. We also had a couple of live questions related to, you know, Amazon and Microsoft and what type of software is required for level three or different levels. Um, so yeah, any insight there? Uh, start with you, Stacy, on like how, like what's yeah. needed or anything? So you don't need GCC high to comply with maturity level three. It will certainly help you get there, but there are other security implementations that you can employ in your environment that will certainly get you to level three. So that's perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I see we have like we have like probably 20 more live questions here, so we're not gonna be able to get to them all. We only have five minutes left, but I'll try to uh, pick out a few that uh, we can follow up on here quick. So let me just take a peek. Um, we have a question: um, Does inherited practices include outsourced IT support? Yes. Number one area of inheritance is managed service providers supporting the IT department and or being the IT department for a contractor. So the answer is absolutely yes. And then remember, if they're handling, storing, transmitting CUI, they have to be level three. So. And they have to be level three. And that's the big thing about understanding inheritance. Yeah. Um, and then Don's asking, how do you assess companies that have multiple layers of subsidiaries that all do government contracting? Scoping. It's all about scoping of what's the, the consideration for that particular contract. Remember, these are by contract definitions, so it's by contract. Mm -hmm. If, for example, they have multiple cage codes because they're a very large system integrator, which I know is out there, and they do it that way, it's by contract. This integrator that I'm thinking of, they have 70 cage codes. They have 265 government contracts. It's by contract. That's how it's currently set up. It's by contract. Um, then we have a, a couple of questions about US citizenship. Um, one of them here is asking is, right. can they attend the CCP training or is this restricted to only US citizens? No. Yeah. I mean, we got, 10 to 15% of all defense contractors are outside the US and are non-US entity organizations. So no, they don't have to be a US citizen. All, uh, and all the it's just a couple of acts. Huh? Yeah. Go ahead. So all the requirements um, specifically uh -huh. for, for CPCAs are up on the CMMC AB website. Absolutely. All right, we have time for just a couple more here. So let's see. Um, oops, just lost it. Okay, can I segment my network and certify only that segment? Uh, for example, we have um, five remote offices, and can we start with certification for you know only certain offices? Yeah, it's called enclaves. Absolutely, and that is one way that organizations. That's where the scoping comes in. Yeah. So, so yes. you, that's, that's what scoping is, right? You're going oh, here. It is here. It is here. It is. Exactly. Yeah, so my takeaway from much of this is scoping is, is very, very important for, for <laughs> executing on this. <laughs> um, we have another question here. Um, can you cover role-based training requirements? What is the evidence that would support that? Training attendance in a class for system administrators in the role is being the system administrator of elevated privilege. Therefore, they get extra training around how do they handle other people's accounts? How do they create accounts? How do they control what those other accounts do? That's a role that's called system administrator. That's an elevated privilege. That's beyond the normal user training that everybody gets every year. All right, That's a role-based training effort. Um, yeah, we'll take uh, two more quick questions here and then wrap up. Um, one question here is, is a badging system or something similar required for facility security or is a uh, security surveillance system with a sign-in logbook acceptable? Very specific. Or, <laughs> or. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you hit each requirement for, for those uh, personnel security, physical security areas. So what you'll do is you'll go right down those requirements and make sure you hit each one. That That's how you would go and assess those. So if you have a badging system, you would also have to have that monitored, for instance. 
Okay. Um, and then the last question we'll take here, um, apologies to those that we didn't get to, um, feel free to uh, reach out um, if, you, if you need some advice. Um, but the last one here is just to clarify, if a MSP is performing all of the IT services for a contractor, this MSP should also be assessed under the CMMC level the contractor is being assessed, right? If they, if they handle CUA, yes. Process, yep. So think of it this way. Any MSP out there, if you are transmitting, storing, or processing CUI data, anyone, right? Any organization, you have to be a level three. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, there's a number of questions you didn't get to. One of the questions was, is it okay to reach out to uh, you, Leighton and Stacy? And if so, what is Absolutely. the best way for them to do that? Okay. And is there a good way, like LinkedIn, or how would you recommend people get? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, you know, I sort of out there. I'm on the Siemens AB um, marketplace. So Stacy, yep. and so you can get a hold of us through there because we're both on the marketplace as officially Siemens AB active participants. Yep. And I know Jeff. They can contact us through InfoSec Institute too. <laughs> yep, exactly. Feel free to, to send us an email. Uh, you can send our web webinars at infosecinstitute.com. Uh, it's a good way to, to submit any questions you have and we can follow up. Um, but yeah, but with that, we are out of time. If we didn't get to all your questions, uh, like I said, reach out and you know, we'd be happy to answer them one on one. Um, Infosec is both a CMMC licensed par partner publisher and a licensed training provider. So, uh, you know, we have a, a good amount of information on what's going on. A uh, reminder that we did have two previous webcasts. So if you have the slide deck, uh, which we'll send in the email, uh, you can go ahead and check those out, get other questions answered. Um, and then we also have a lot of resources on our CMMC page. So if you go to infosecinstitute.com slash CMMC, we have links to all three webinars, links to our ebook, um, and as well as a uh, a series of articles that we have on CMMC. So lots of support materials uh, if you go to our website slash CMMC. Uh, so as we, as we wrap up, I wanna thank everyone for joining. Uh, when the webcast ends here in a moment, a short survey will appear. Uh, we'd appreciate if you take just one minute to complete the survey so we can use that feedback and, and know what it is that you're all interested in us covering in the future. Um, a special thanks to Leighton and Stacy for the great discussion today. And we hope to see you for future webcasts. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.